So then Johnny passed away, and Sandy took up, picked up the ball and ran with it, and it has evolved into maybe 25 or 50 people. To what you see, they have 199 reservations here today. How about it for Sandy Robinson? about cost for the food and everything, she donates, out of the goodness of her heart, to Mrs. Cox Banquet, which is Tuesday or Wednesday. Wednesday at the Peabody. And so 40 million, Mark James. Suspicious mind. And this past year, he was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. And it's a pretty big people in the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Uh, Mark James will be talking. Also, the little pretty lady over here with a gray, out, gray black and red outfit and gray hair. She's as pretty as she ever was. She was one of Elvis's favorite girlfriends in the early years. It's Barbara Hearn. And sitting next to Barbara, she needs no introduction. That's the famous Miss Marion Duck. She's got a book out, and she did not write the book to make money. She wrote the book, I'll be honest with you, because Elvis's father, Vernon, asked her to write the book, because she was so close to Elvis. Okay, and next to her is a little lady who was in Elvis's motion picture, Kiss and, Co Kiss and Cousins. I kind of like that. We played twins, didn't we, in that movie. Cynthia Pepper. And, uh, of the Memphis Mafia people, me and Dino are the only originals up here today because, well, this young lady, her husband was Richard Davis. He was an original member of the Memphis Mafia. Miss Kim Davis War. I got it right. And you know what happened? The last few months that she was married to Richard, uh, she wanted to get pregnant. I'll just tell you the truth. And she couldn't get pregnant. So she went to New York where Celine Dion went, right, Kim? And she got pregnant. <laughs> Tri triplets. <laughs> she got triplets. And one of them is a spitting image, isn't he, Dana Bartle? You see it, Mrs. Cox. Of El Richard. And then a beautiful daughter. Madison's the daughter's name. It's Madison and Brandon and Dylan. They're not here today, are they? Okay. But anyway, this is Kim, and she knows all of Richard's stories. And Richard had as many stories about Elvis as I did. He was a guy that Elvis called uh, Broom. Is that right? What was on the back of his broom? Was on the back of Beer Brain. Well, Beer Brain was on the back of his brain. But we all call him Broom because he was so thin at one time. He didn't get he didn't stay thin. <laughs> yeah, very good. Okay, she'll be talking in Richard's behalf here today. Also, this guy needs no introduction. His name is Will Bardall McDaniel. And Will, uh, Elvis gave him the name Bardo. It's a long story, so I'll shorten it down. I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. Elvis had rented the roller rink one night, and Will used to race stock cars. And his daddy used to drive for NAS, not NASCAR, but early NASCAR type thing. Bardo and his dad ran stock cars over in West Memphis. And uh, the night we rented the skating rink, uh, Bardot was always here with us, and he was a very good skater, roller skater, and he worked at the Rainbow. But Mr. P P Pucchese, what was his name? Perichini. And so he had on a Bardot t-shirt, which I was at all attitude. And you know, so we all stuck talk. That became his name, Bardot. But he got some pretty good stories. Sitting next to him is a good friend of mine. And by the way, if you need a new car, I want you to buy a car from him. <laughs> Because he's a hot shot car salesman. Uh, that's where I buy most of my cars uh, out there at Sunrise uh, Buick, not Buick, Sunrise Buick. Buick Winchester. Winchester. It's the number one uh, car dealership in Memphis. And his dad, of course, was Dr. George Nicopolis, who was my doctor. And I introduced Elvis to Dr. Nick. And then Dean came along, graduated from high school, and Elvis brought him aboard to be with, with, with the Memphis Mafia guys. And he, she's got some great stories about snow skiing in Colorado and all kinds of really funny and hilarious. But uh, somebody else probably will walk in from time to time. Oh, I forgot to mention, would have ever left Memphis and stayed in Hollywood permanently? And I said, no way. He loved Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, if you saw that little video, when he got out of the Army, he asked him if he was going to sell it. And, uh, I guess I better get away from that monitor. So, uh, 
He said, no, I'll keep racing as long as I possibly can. He has some beautiful homes in Bel Air, the famous home at 525 Perugia Way, where Ann Martin came up and he read my book, and we did a little peeping through the glass watching Elvis and Ann Martin, and we'll get into that later. I said, that's a long story. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I always loved Memphis, Tennessee, just like I did. We graduated from high school together, 1953, from Humes. Red West was one, he was one year behind us, but he was the same age. Red is a guy who, you may recall, I think they, she submitted a lot of documentaries, where three guys courted Elvis in the bathroom. Uh, he was going to cut his hair, and Red walked in. And uh, so what are you guys doing? Red's a real, in real, real life, he's a real tough guy, and he did Barnell I'll tell you that. I mean, he, he was a street fighter, karate guy, all-American, all junior college football star. Uh, he, he was a tough guy. He wrote a lot of great songs. He wrote If Every Day Was Like Christmas. He wrote uh, uh, Separate Ways for Elvis. He wrote uh, Don't Keep Talking Your Street, Don't Mention My Name. And he wrote uh, a lot of great songs for Elvis. And uh, Red came in. This was way before that, though. And nobody in Humes thought Red could write songs. Or because he had a little band. He was in action the same talent show that Elvis won our senior class year. But anyway, Red walks in. And you ask these guys, what are you going to do in there? Oh, Red, what are you saying? Well, phone help us. Come on, help us cut his hair. Red said, Red said, I don't think he wants his hair cut. Oh, come on, Red. And Red said, you better get out of here. I'm, I'm going to clean you up. Throw you down this commode over here. So they, they got out of there. And from that moment on, Elvis and Red were fast friends. And Red was his first bodyguard on the road. And a lot of stories about Red. But she now he has a home in Clearwater, Florida, and also has a home in Memphis. But uh, Red was, was very close to the game. Sandy's new book, okay, good. It's called Pigtails, Presley, and Pepper. And the reason it's pigtails is because my show Margie, I wear braids, you know, pigtails, if you've ever seen it, and as a child, and it's a, it's a and Presley, I don't need to explain that, and my last name is Pepper. Well, it's a, it's a memoir, and it's a, it's a family um, show business story. And the thread of Elvis is in it from the very beginning, and there's a, obviously a passage where I worked with Elvis and became his friend, and then I move on to where I am now. So if you'd like to have it, it's over there uh, to buy it. But I'm so happy that I co-wrote it with a friend of mine in Canada through the phone and email, which is a very difficult thing to do. And I call it the good, the bad, not too ugly. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a story about my family. Uh, nothing's really, you know, I don't get into anything really. I'm a kiss and tell, but there's enough, hopefully, that you'd be interested in. And so, uh, thank you for asking. So, we're gonna get well, I've got it here, and I'm going to have it at Marion's dinner, and also it's co uh, conversations with Tom Brown, but also on Amazon and uh, Author House and um, Barnes and Noble online. And so, if you do, I hope you enjoy it. If you do, read it. I would like for you to comment, you know, on Amazon or something. I mean, if, even if you have, you know, not too good things to say, but hopefully it won't be that way. I'd like to hear the feedback from people, you know. You know, I've seen a lot of you people before, but the, the story is, and it's true, and it's also in my book, that when we were shooting it, you know, you rehearse, you rehearse, and, and, and the camera's here, and the light's here, and I said, I said Elvis, and they said, okay, let's shoot it, take one. Take two, take three. I kept messing it up, George. So I could do it over and over, and I think the ladies would understand that. It was a very sweet kiss. Very nice. You know, on my radio show, quite often they become regular, so to speak. Wink Martindale and, and uh, Sandy Farrah Martindale. And Sandy did it almost when she was very, very young. And uh, so, I, it always at the end of the interview, I said, Sandy, who was the best kisser, Elvis or Wink? And she said, well, Elvis was the best kisser, but Wink's the best husband. <laughs> She's very diplomatic about that. Dino Nicopolis. Oh, Dino, he was a... He was a champion racquetball player, and that's how, you see that racquetball court behind Graceland with all the awards in it, uh, all the um, mind-boggling awards. You see, the, when you walk down the gold hallway of gold records, and then you go into the racquetball court, it was really built for racquetball because we were renting, do you remember, we were renting the JCC, uh, Memphis, Memphis Day, uh, Memphis Country Club. We would at midnight go over and rent and play racquetball. And Dean was teaching Elvis how to play. Racquetball is a tough sport. And it gets you into shape real quick like. But did this. 
Anyways, he, he and Dr. Nick had a racquetball court built into their house. <laughs> but we couldn't go over there late night and play. We'd wake up the whole family. But anyway, Dean accomplished. Dean, tell them the story, if you will, about Denver, Colorado, when you got hurt on the snow slope. Uh, we, were, we were in Colorado and we were going down these ski slopes and Elvis was about 2.30 in the morning and uh, I looked at him and I said, I think that's it. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in. I'm tired. Anyway, he looks at me and says, no, nah, we're, we're going to go one more time then everybody's going to go in. And uh, we weren't going down just these little slopes. We were going down the, the real ski slopes and we were using these garbage can saucers and we were sitting on them and just going down so you had no control. But we went down there the last time. We were actually trying to hold hands, a bunch of guys, sort of goofy, but hold hands, and we were flying down there, and that was just having a ball. Well, I hit this piece of wood in a fence, and I thought I broke my leg. So Elvis uh, decides to call 911 to come check my leg out, and he goes in the, now he's got a ski mask on because, you know, we're all in a ski mask out there because it was cold. Anyway, so he keeps his ski mask on, he gets in the ambulance with me, and we're sitting in the back. And he's trying to tell the paramedic what's wrong with me, and I'm trying to let the paramedic tell Elvis what's wrong, but, you know, Elvis was in control of the paramedic. But anyway, so we go to the hospital, and uh, I get my knee checked out, and they look at it, and they say, well, you just really jammed it real bad. And uh, so we go to give them the insurance card. My insurance card said Elvis Presley Estates. It was a Blue Cross card. And the lady, there was a nurse sitting right here, and Elvis was sitting right here, and a couple of guys were right here. And uh, she's sort of a little arrogant. She says, well, where is Elvis like that? And uh, nobody said anything because we were going like, I ain't saying nothing because we don't want nobody to know where we were. So anyway, she looks at Elvis in the, in the ski mask and she says, well, who are you? He turns around, looks at her and he says, I'm a Lone Ranger to you. And that was it. <laughs> and so we, we, we went back to the place. And the reason why we did that was because if you remember, Ford had his daughter up there and then the house beside us had Michael Landon. And nobody wanted to know where we were because we didn't want everybody to bother the whole thing. That they would ruin the whole. <laughs> so that's what happened. Wow. Uh, I, I, I'll tag along on that story. Hey, what was the name of that place where they had the tennis tournament where you had racquetball courts? Uh, ooh, Memphis Athletic Club. Or Memphis, uh, uh, Memphis Athletic Club. Club. There's a place called Memphis Athletic Club, and uh, <clears throat> it's a, a very nice place. They have the championship tennis there. But anyway, it's some nice racquetball courts. And so we're playing racquetball. I wasn't much of a player. I was learning like everybody else. Dean and his dad were champions. We were learning. And so uh, Jerry Schilling is with me. And I had already uh, prepped Jerry what I was going to do. I, I told Jerry, I said, Jerry, I'm going to explain it to Elvis, but i got to hit the right time. If your timing is bad, you can forget it. So they're playing racquetball. This is a good story. So... Uh, Play racquetball, and uh, I look at Cherry. Elvis is here. Elvis is, no, Cherry Shelley is here. Uh, Elvis is here, and I'm here. We're just sitting down taking a break, and uh, nobody else was around. And I said, Cherry, you think it's time to hit him with it now? He looked at me, what are you guys up to now? <coughs> and I said, Elvis, there's a guy in California, a friend of mine, an engineer from Cal Poly Tech. Now, this is 30. Seven, 39 years ago, I think 39 years ago, this guy approached me and he said, I said, Elvis, he wants to do a, a hologram on you. He said, this is what he said, he said, hologram, holla shit, what are you talking about? <laughs> he know what, I didn't know what a hologram was either until the guy gave me a, a, a little sample of what it was about. So I said, well, Elvis, this guy wants to take you to Howard Hughes Aircraft in Los Angeles. They're the only one he can do it this time. Holograms are something that's brand new. Nobody, you always like something nobody else has. He says, yeah, that's right. I said, Elvis, they want to shoot you and, and with your full regalia on, your, your white jumpsuit and everything, like you're on stage, and with this hologram machine, and then it'll take him about three weeks to put it together, and then when your concert ends, the lights go down, the image of you will float right across the audience and out the back door. And Jerry Schilling said, Elvis, that's a pretty good idea. And Elvis, <laughs> you know how he would he'd stand up, straighten himself out. <clears throat> he said, look, guys, appreciate y'all bringing it to me first, but I never used a gimmick in my act. I ain't starting now. <laughs> so he, he wouldn't do it. He, he didn't want to give it because...
Jimi Hendrix was using the electric stuff and burning the guitars and all those entertainers over he, he, he said, I go out and just give a show, I just sang. Any other questions? Way in the back. What year were you in Colorado and catch Deaker? What year were you in Colorado? She's got a mic. I think it was 77. 77. Okay. Where'd y'all, what city was it? Well, we, we went to Vail. Vail? We went to Vail. We went to Vail. In Vail, Colorado. And then that same year, I think we went, I think we went to uh, Hawaii, remember? The, the trip oh, yeah. in Hawaii. That's right. Did you go on that with us to Hawaii? No, no, yeah, no, I thought no. you did. I went to Elvis in Hawaii 1957 uh, when he made the, uh, when he first appeared a little bit. We were making Jill House Rock. At the end of the movie, Jill House Rock, we went to Hawaii. This is something I found out. I never knew about this. We go to Hawaii, and first of all, he had the big entourage. Well, it wasn't the big entourage. It was me, his cousin Gene Smith, Arthur Hooten from his neighborhood, and Colonel Park and his guys, and the Jordanaires, and the band. They were going to do four shows in Honolulu. So we get on this. We all said, hey, Elvis, go on to Hawaii. Man, that's great. When does the plane leave? He said, we ain't flying. <laughs> we said, what do you mean you're not flying? See, his mother asked him not to fly. So as you know the story, he wouldn't fly until she was on her deathbed. He flew home from basic training. And then when he got out of the army, he flew that was it and he'll start flying again. But then he wouldn't fly in 57. And so uh, she asked him not to. They had a situation that occurred and somebody asked me, I'll tell you later. But anyway, we go to Hawaii, we go from the SS Lurley, we came back on the SS Masonian. And so when the ship landed in Hawaii, it was customary, I don't know if it still is in Hawaii, these girls meet you when you come off the ship or out the airplane, and they put a little flower lay on around your neck, and they get to kiss you. And so Elvis, you've probably seen some of those pictures, he had flower lays up to his neck because they all want to kiss him, you know. And he had lipstick was all over his face, man. So we get back to the hotel, and we check in. At that time, it was called the Hawaiian Hilton. Now it's called something else. Uh, anyway, no, it's called the Hawaiian Hilton now. And then it was called Hawaii, uh, Hawaiian, Hawaiian Village. And so we're checking in the hotel. It always goes in the service entrance. And so me and a guy named with us, a guy with us at the time named Cliff Leaves. He was crazy. Cliff was the most unforgivable character you'll ever meet. About my size, a former disc jockey out of Jackson, Tennessee. And then, I'll never forget him. He's driving down Union Avenue at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and he sees Elvis on the side of the street. Elvis's car is going out of gas. 5 o'clock traffic, Elvis is out of gas. So Cliff backs up, and he says, Can I, Elvis, he's a big Elvis fan. He said, Elvis, Elvis, what's happening? Well, man, he said, Elvis, said, you know, Cliff, uh, what's your name? He said, Cliff Lee. I'm a friend of Wick Martindale's and George Clyde. He said, oh, good, man. Can you give me a ride home? And Cliff said, yeah. <laughs> so people asked Elvis, how did Cliff become a member of your, your entourage and your Memphis Mafia? He said, well, I was hitchhiking home on Union Avenue. I invited him home for dinner. He stayed 10 damn years. <laughs> Cliff wouldn't leave. So we get to the hotel. Cliff was a funny guy. And so we get to the hotel. Well, Elvis has already checked in. So we're checking in. And I asked the desk clerk, I said, is anybody famous staying in the same, has stayed, has stayed in the same suite that Elvis stayed in? And they said, yeah. And I said, who? And uh, the guy said, Elizabeth Taylor and, uh, what was it, Michael, Michael, Michael what? Todd. Michael Todd, yeah. I can't hear that. So I said, what, Elizabeth Taylor? You mean she had the bed Elvis was going to have? He said, yeah. So as soon as we got up to the suite, we threw our luggage on the floor, and Cliff and I ran and dove in his bed. And Elvis, what you fools doing, man? He said, Elvis, we can always say we slept in the bed with Lewis Taylor. Lewis <laughs> Taylor. But he got a kid. But anyway, we went to Hawaii, and uh, Elvis loved Hawaii, and Hawaii loved him, and he did four shows there. And uh, it's obvious because he did three motion pictures, and Dean went back many times for vacation, sent me to Hawaii, no, all expenses paid once, me and my wife. Uh, he really loved Hawaii a whole lot. And I would say that Elvis is two favorite places to visit outside of, not, well, not, you live here, but to visit was Las Vegas and Hawaii. Is that right, Dino? He, he loved Vegas. Wow, did he ever love Vegas? And I'll never forget the first time I went to Vegas. He said, GK, we got to come in at night. He wasn't playing Vegas. We were just partying. We, had a good, we stayed out there for about 10 days. 10 days in Vegas when you party, man, you don't get no sleep. But anyway, we get there and we're at the top of the hotel. And I said, man, Elvis, that's beautiful. All those lights on. And he said, yeah, GK. He said, uh, here you are in the 
king of the cities of, of show business. You came in on a king with a king. Now you're with the king himself. <laughs> and we're all looking to Las Vegas. Clips, yeah, I know that else. But we had a great, great time in Vegas. Uh, when we went out there just partying, I can't remember if anything crazy happened. But a lot of crazy things happened when he was making people Las Vegas with Ann Martin. We'll get around to that. Somebody asked me that a little bit later. I'm talking too much. Anybody got a question? My favorite story about Elvis was, uh, well, when he gave me the first Cadillac, I have two favorites. And so I was going on the radio, and Richard came down with Jerry Schilling, two of Elvis and Memphis Mafia guys, and he said, Elvis wants to see you. And I said, man, I'm going on the air in 15 minutes. I can't leave. George is pretty important. It's about, it was December, it's about, 10 days before Christmas. And so I called my boss and he said, okay, GK, if it's Elvis, just tell the disc jockey who's ahead of you to work a couple hours and you owe him some time. I said, okay. So I get in the limousine and Richard is driving and her former husband and we're going down Union Avenue again. And I said, guys, you're going the wrong way. I said, because Grayson is that way. We, said, we know what Grayson is, but Richard and Jerry said. So we pull up to the Cadillac dealership. This time it's about 7 o'clock at night. It's winter time already, December. It's dark. I said, nobody's here. They said, uh, well, he's got to be here somewhere. I said, why is Elvis here? He said, well, he's buying himself a new Cadillac. Well, they, I, I believe that story. So we go up to the dealership, and no, it was all dark. And I opened the door to the dealership, and Elvis liked big productions. And all the lights on the showroom floor came on. How many showroom floor the dealership? So uh, in the right in the middle was a brand new yellow 68 Cadillac convertible. Well, I'm thinking, well, that's Elvis' car. He just wants to show it to me. So I walk up, we called him E, and I said, hey, E, what's up? And he said, hold out your right hand. He held out my right hand. And he dropped the keys in and he said, Merry Christmas. And but the best part about that is, I said, Elvis, making radio and television, I should make an Academy Award winning speech now. I don't know what to say. Elvis was about six foot two with his boots on, put his arm around me, and he said, GK, what is fame and fortune if you can't share it with your friends? That, that was my favorite. The other one was what he gave me his friends. Mark was, was, had the number one band in Houston, Texas, and he gave that all up because Chip Smallman, who had this little tiny studio called American in North Memphis, was uh, producing big hits out of there. So Mark came up, and when he got here, I looked him up, found out about him. Mark James, he was in the Houston Symphony playing lead violin when he was 13 years old. Mark James, I'm embarrassing you, but it's the truth. Mark James can play 12 instruments. Man, he, he can play 12. That's how talented he is as a music person. And a songwriter, booked on the feeling for B.J. Thomas, as for New York Corner, B.J. Thomas, uh, uh, Moody Blue, one of my really favorite Elvis songs. He wrote that. But ladies and gentlemen, I found out just recently, and he agrees to that because he gets paid on it, Suspicious Minds has sold today, to this day, 40 million copies. It's Elvis' biggest selling record. You know, uh, I came up here around 67, 68-ish, uh, and uh, Memphis was a great place. I mean, it was uh, it was a different place. I used to go in studios in Houston, Texas, and uh, I produced them, but I had an engineer. I had, uh, you know, I tell them what I wanted. But when I came to Memphis, it was a different story. Uh, most people here, they engineer their own records, and uh, I, I really said, so, well, you know, you can kind of shoot for your sound more, what you're hearing. And uh, Chip Smoan was a fantastic engineer. William Mitchell was a fantastic engineer. And so a lot of people around uh, Memphis did that and had success because uh, they, they could engineer and come up with their own sound. And it was a real casual place. I mean, you could go to nightclubs here, and there would be Isaac and David Porter just kind of sitting in, singing their songs. and. Uh, it was really natural and, and kind of uh, free. And that's one thing Memphis has, is the free spirit. I mean, uh, we can all pass away, and, and uh, there will always be trend-setting people coming out of here. It's, it's got something here. I don't, some people say it's the river. I don't know what it is, but it's, it's here. Uh, 
And, uh, but when I came to Memphis, uh, box tops were number one with uh, the letter, and uh, Chips had just had uh, number one hit with Cindy Posey, Born a Woman. They weren't doing anything pop, kind of pop like that. They would have, they, during Rocky, they had uh, Keep On Dancing years ago, and things like that. I really came up as an artist uh, and to produce and write. He said, come on up here, we're dealing with everything. And so I came up, and so I got interested in, in you know, making mortgage too, but I was still, I originally came up to be an artist too. Uh, I recorded, uh, I started writing and recording, I recorded uh, uh, Suspicious Minds for Scepter myself in 1968. And I went up to New York, and we had a big meeting, and everybody in the world thought it was a smash. And, uh, and, uh, but it was a small label. Scepter was a small label. They had Dion Warwick, uh, B.J. Thomas, and they had, uh, you know, like the Shirelles of, uh, uh, or, you know, 50 groups and things like that, 60s. And, 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 and so it was a small label, and a small R&B and gospel label. And uh, they only could handle what they could do. And, and uh, so as I was, uh, it never happened on me, and that was fine, but it, 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 uh, all the promotional people there said, oh, smash, smash, and up in the air, and Chips and I, they even gave Chips a Rolls Royce for producing that record, oh yeah. We drove back from Memphis to uh, New York to here in it. And uh, so I got back, and, and uh, the, at that time, the B.J. Thomas, I was approached, why don't you try writing for other people? You know, and I've never done that before. I always written songs for myself. And so I said, nah, you know, it's an idea. So I, I thought about it. And uh, I thought about B.J. Thomas. B.J., and I had met B.J. back in Houston and, and years ago. Uh, back when I had, I had like three number one records in Houston, Texas. And, uh, and uh, the third one was what I was trying to do. Uh, it was uh, number, Broke the Singles Records for Louisiana, Soul, in 1964. <laughs> And, and, and I was leased to Jamie Guy, and that's what you try to do on a small label. You try to get such a big hit record that you're finally picked up nationally. And I always figured, you know, if you can have a hit regionally or regional promotion, why can't you have a hit nationally with national promotion? So anyway, the minute that I was picked up, I got papers from Uncle Sam on his drafted. And uh, that, that ended my career. I will never forget it. I will never forget being in uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana, and I could hear my record number one over and over again. And uh, and my manager said, why don't you do six months? So I got get in, get out, keep your career going. And I said, uh, wait a minute. I said, uh, I got to be a musician five days a week and a soldier two days a week, musician five days. I mean, so uh, how many days, how many years do I have to do that? And you know, you do it two or three years, make a reserve meetings or more. And I said, no, I can't do that. I got to, you're my friend, I mean, I got, I got to go in and get it over with. Uh, and so I did. And uh, so anyway, I went in and uh, I was sent overseas to Vietnam in my last four months. And uh, they let me put a band together in the boat. That's probably the best band I ever put together. <laughs> Might have been our last gig, you know. But uh, anyway, I came back. I came back. My career was ice cold. So I came back. You know, it's a funny thing. When you make records, you, now they only have to have the right song for the right time. They have to be released at the right time. Otherwise, if you wait so long, and I do believe this, when you write a song or come up with a great idea, it kind of floats. That idea is floating around. I've seen it so many times at American writing songs that if you didn't get that out and three or four months later, you see the same title coming out. And something about that. And so you had to really get it out. So. When I was offered a gig to come up here to Memphis, Tennessee, and I was started out writing for myself. And then with BJ, I said, uh, you know, why don't you try writing for other people? And I said, well, that's an idea. You know, and so I, I, I started working with BJ, and, I, and uh, I came up with what I was trying to do. I said, let's make it a little interesting. Let's I didn't make a metal singer exciting. And, and uh, that year, BJ's, BG's had How Do You Mend a Broken Heart? But that image did not draw a lot of people to the Coliseum to see them. I mean, later, later on, they had Saturday Night Fever image with all those hits, and they found their bag. And boy, they just couldn't keep people away then. So with BJ, I said, uh, and BJ was a great singer. I mean, he had had, uh, he, he hadn't had a million so yet, but he had like Billion Sue and certain records. And the one that I 
listened to that drove me. I said, I, I'm so lonesome I could cry. I said, he can sing. And so uh, I tried to come up with, uh, first thing, I, I said, how do you make a metal singer exciting? And what I was saying was, how do you make people run out and try to buy his record or run out and try to see him at the Coliseum or his shows? Exciting, you know, exciting about it. So uh, the first record song I came up with, Eyes of a New York Woman. And the second one, I, I hit on what I was trying to do. Uh, uh, a black friend of mine in, in uh, Alabama called me and said, uh, Mark, he said, man, when I heard Hooked on a Feeling, I had to pull my car over and run into the record store, and I whipped up my money, and I said, Hooked on a Feeling. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's what I tried to do. And, uh, and, but anyway, that's the little thing about Memphis. I'll tell you one thing about Suspicious Minds. That's really one of my favorite. The, uh, Suspicious Minds came out. I changed my name from 1960. Uh, my original name is Francis Zambon. And my dad was Italian. And I, boy, I sit in playing clubs and all that stuff. And uh, nobody back in, back in the 50s, maybe it's that year, <laughs> could pronounce much, but they goofed my name up so bad, I, I just didn't feel like going on stage. And I said, I got to think of something simple. And so during those years, you know, a lot of first name names like Ray Charles and things like that. And I was driving down the street, and uh, uh, Ray Charles, I mean, Mark James hit me. I said, not bad, not bad. And I lived with him about six months and said, not bad. So I started recording under that and writing under that since 1960. So anyway, Suspicious Minds comes out when Elvis recorded that. The first batch of records came into American Studio. And I opened it up and looked at it. And it said, Suspicious Minds. Great, fantastic. I looked at it and looked at it. It's so written by Fred, F-R-E-D, Zamborn, Z-A-N-B-O-R-N. I mean, they didn't get any, anyone or any name right. And I said, I can't believe this. I cannot believe this. And uh, a good friend of Elvis called, called Elvis. And uh, I mean, this was really fantastic. He called all the records back to the plant and repressed the whole thing. And it came out Mark Jenkins. And that was fantastic. Elvis came to record. He goes to American Studios. If you read my book, at the first chapter, where I talk about get up and make the speech at his dinner table, that Elvis, uh, the guys at the end of the table there, they're bringing you B-sides because they get part of the publishing, sometimes part of the writer. And I said, Elvis, they don't do that anymore in this business. That's an artistic thing. I said, so that's why they're bringing you second-rate songs. They gave them to you in the movies. Now they want to give them to you now. I said, Elvis, you just did the 68 special, the biggest rated television show in the history of television. You're back on top again. You're the biggest star in the world. And I said, Elvis, they're talking about they can't get this drummer, Hal Blaine, in Los Angeles. I said, Elvis, we got great musicians here. They just played on Neil Diamond's Sweet Caroline, his biggest selling record. They played on Neil Diamond's Brother Love's Traveling Salvation Show. And they played on Neil Diamond's... Uh, uh, what was the album Mark he cut there in America? Oh, Holly Holy. Elvis loved Holly Holy. So, so uh, I said, Elvis, there's a little studio. It's only about three blocks from the McGill's High School where we went to school over in Thomas and Chelsea in North Memphis. They're red hot. This guy, Chip Smolin, he's fantastic. He's a great writer. He's got a great rhythm section. He's got studio musicians who are out of sight. And Elvis, they're charming to get the best to play behind you. And they want you to go to Hollywood and cut. And you can't get this musician. I said, Elvis, that's a bunch of bull. And I said, Elvis, you should put your foot down. But they went to the table. It was Harry Bean, I'm Beanstalk, and Auberbach from the publishers. They were at the table, and poor Felton was over the corner. He, he came later and told me he had no choice because he had to please Elvis from Park and RCA. But anyway, so I made that speech, and I'll never forget it. It seemed, it seemed like eternity. And, and I said, well, all he can do is throw me out of his house. I don't work for him anymore. And I was sitting to his right. If you go through Graceland, Elvis always sat at the end of the table. Priscilla was on his left that night. I was on the right. And Elvis stood up there again. And straightened, he'd always straighten himself up, Dean, when he's going to say something important. He said, look. And he looked up at the ceiling and he said, GK is right. He said, Felton, forget about Hollywood. Get that studio clients talking about over North Memphis. As far as songs, I'm opening the gate. I don't want no writers. I don't want no publishers. I want damn good songs. And man, the table went nuts. 
They started high-fiving around the table. Huck came over to hug me. Damn, you can't, as you said what you said, you know, we just can't say stuff like that. I said, I know, but, you know, I, I can say it. And I took a hell of a chance because, folks, I'll tell you, when you talk to superstars, especially when you talk to Elvis Presley, you don't say anything like what I said with the crowd around. You get him off into private because, you know, if he disagrees with you, it could be embarrassing. So normally I should have got him off into Grandma's room or upstairs in his room and told him that. But it's just one of those moments in life that comes upon you. you got to take advantage of it, Mark. You know what I'm talking about. It, it, those moments don't come around very often. And he said, so he said, so Felton immediately went over, got on the phone and got Chip's moment. The studio was set for the next Monday. That was a weekend. And then uh, Mark brought in Kentucky Rain. Uh, Neil Diamond, I called Neil Diamond. He sent in a grass to paint on mine. But uh, Mark had already done Suspicious Minds. And oh, we went over there, and Matt Davis, who wrote some of that little less conversation, by the way, we made him her twice. But uh, uh, Matt Davis sent in a tape, and on the tape was in the ghetto, Don't Cry Daddy, another smash shit. I'm just telling you, all the songs were given to Elvis, that little bitty tiny studio, and Colonel Parker's people could not touch it. And so, uh, when Suspicious Minds was Chip's moment, you know the story, Mark, tell me, when uh, Suspicious was well, in it. I didn't know it, but Elvis uh, was coming in the studio, he booked the studio for two weeks, you know, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I didn't know he was coming in with 40 songs of his own, uh, I had no idea what he was coming in with, I'm sure he was coming in with material, but, uh, but uh, I met Elvis in a four-year of American Studios, I guess he was kind of getting used to it, and it, and George introduced uh, Elvis twice, and uh, I had been trying, and, and I, when I heard Elvis was coming to the studio, sometimes I can tell, some, uh, now and then I can tell, there's something in here, a great song for somebody, and I try to write it, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But that year, I said, Elvis has come in, yeah, what kind of song would you know, bring me, kind of, his career, had, when I say bring him back, it, uh, what I meant to Top 40 Radio. Uh, his career had kind of slumped from Top 40 Radio because he was doing films. And uh, people like Tom Jones had taken over the top, and he was number one. I also consider that because uh, how long can you be? Could you be? He was uh, number one sex symbol, rock and roll sex symbol. And uh, it's kind of new, and, and uh, we really don't know. I mean, I mean, look at the Stones. Now, you're probably as old as you want to, <laughs> as long as you can play and sing. But uh, uh, anyway, I was trying to come up with something, and I had went through my old catalog, and, I, and I, uh, one of them, uh, the biggest, and I said, no, it's not right for him. So I was trying to write a new song. And uh, every time I'd go in the studio, there'd be uh, uh, Chips' partner with American Studios was Don Cruz. Uh, he was upstairs in the office. He said, you know, Elvis is coming in. I said, yeah, I'm trying to come up with something. So every time I'd come back in the studio, he said, did you come up with anything? I said, no, not yet. And, not yet. and, and time narrowed down. It went down to like two days before Elvis was coming in. And finally, I saw Don again. He said, you got anything? I said, no, Don, I, I, it's just not hit me I, I, at all. And he said, what about the old catalog? And as George said, I came up around late 1967 to 68. And so I didn't think about that. There wasn't that many songs in there. So I was thinking that about 68 catalog. And he says, what about the old catalog? And I went down the list and all of a sudden I hit Suspicious Minds. And it done. said, what about Suspicious Minds? And about that time, I, I turned around in a chair and man, like a golden number one. That was a song that I was searching for. About the you know, because I knew it was going to take a mature rock song for all this is what it would take. And all I knew, the song was perfect for him. And I'm so happy that I recorded it uh, at American Studios uh, with Chips and the whole bit. And we worked it up. And, and uh, there's another story. I don't mean to hang on this microphone, but there's another part of the story I've got to say. When I went into the, I lived night and day at that studio, and I, I was producing a group at night. I left the tape on the counter, and I went back into the control room to get it, and they had already started recording. Elvis was out there singing, and Chips was here, Felton was here at the board, and I went in to get a tape, and all of a sudden I heard Elvis out there singing any day now. And I looked through the glass, and I saw him singing, and he looked at me, and I looked at him, and I could tell like that, he, he was real uncomfortable about me watching him sing his material songs, because, uh, you know, I'm a singer too, I know that, and I, I 
just picked up on it and I said, no, I cannot be here when he records my song. I cannot be here. No way. Uh, it won't work. Me looking at him through the glass, no way. And so uh, at that point, I said, uh, you know something? For the first time in my life, you, I would have been there if it hadn't been for this. Uh, uh, it was the same studio. They get the same sound. The same musicians. Musicians are funny. You can you can play something, and if you go, play too long and go to an hour and a half past that, they can't remember what they did unless you play them what they did. They, they zoom in on like that, and uh, because they cut, they recorded my record with me. We had something to play on, and they could come back and remind them what they did immediately and get back to it. And all I was hoping was that uh, they could not change it that much, but try to make it greater if they could. You know, and that's all. And Elvis had a hit ear through the years. I noticed that. He didn't play with a great melody too much because he knew it was there. It's kind of like, kind of like if you get something fantastic like a Mona Lisa or a Mount Masterpiece, when you start painting and changing it up too much, it starts becoming complicated where it's not simplicity. It becomes harder to reach it. So he knew that. And, and uh, so anyway, I knew I had to stay away. So my only hope was, was to tell everybody in the world, get him to cut this. I felt like shaking everybody, including Elvis. <laughs> hey, this is, this is it for you. But, you know, you know, as I tell people, I wasn't selling a used car here. <laughs> you know? But uh, so anyway. I told uh, all his friends around him, including uh, George, to get him to listen to this. It's a great reform. I went downstairs and I told Chips, I said, get him to listen. Play him Suspicious Minds when he comes in. I said, he said, you think it's a hit? I said, I know it's a smash. I hit Play for him. And uh, from that point on, I left it alone. I, I, I stayed away. And uh, <laughs> uh, there's a little more to the story. So about in the middle of the student session, uh, I said, I'm going to go by there. Uh, they say, uh, you know, uh, he, he's, uh, he might have suspicious mind, so I'm thinking about he really needs to record that. And by the way, uh, you're wasting your time. If somebody doesn't want to sing your song, they're going to want to sing it to get that performance. So you're, if somebody doesn't want to sing my song, it's no problem. I'm going to go to the next one or whatever. Because uh, they have to want to sing it. But anyway, in the middle of the session, they had taken a break, and I'm thinking two things. Is he going to record Suspicious Minds? Because it's really a great reform. Could be. So, uh, uh, and, and another thing, is Elvis Elvis, or, or is there a time that people start, you know, imitating themselves? It's been 20 years. I mean, you can do gestures and all that stuff, and I don't know Elvis that well. And so, when I went over to Elvis, there was a break, and Elvis was leaning up against the baffle near the vocal mic and everything, taking a break. He was leaning up against it. I said, Hey, Elvis, I heard you might got suspicious minds. He was leaning against it. He said, Yeah, Mark, been thinking about it. <laughs> what does that sound just like Elvis, the way Elvis talks? And I said, Yeah, that's Elvis, and he's, he's real, and he's thinking about that suspicious minds. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the bottom line is, yeah, they did record it, they tried to make it greater, and they did. Uh, providing Elvis would sing it and get a great performance, and he did. And providing RCA knew what it was, and they started pounding it and promoting it, and it, they did. It was number one in 27 countries. And Elvis was on top again, and so was I. <laughs> Is Elvis's biggest selling record, 40 million. And uh, can I add a PS to that, Mark? Uh, I'm in the control room in America. The control room in American studios, gosh, Mark, was a third of the size of this stage, what it, that was it. So Chip's moment is in there, and uh, Harry Jenkins, the president of RCA, is in there. I'm in there, and Freddie Beanstalk, and Tom Distin from Colonel Parker, watching, watching you know, those are guys that I put down at the dinner table. So Chip says, uh, hey Elvis, he said, uh, we think this suspicious might be a good song for you. And I was just sitting on the corner, and Elvis said, yeah, play that, let me hear it again. He played it for him, and Elvis said, yeah, but I don't like it, Chips, let's do that. And so when he said that, Elvis went back out in the studio, and these two jerks, Tom Diskin from Colonel Parker's office, and Freddie Beanstalk from Hill and Range Music, who had been bringing in crappy material, they jumped up and said, 
Elms, uh, I mean Chips, Chips, I mean, uh, Chips Roman, uh, we got to have part of the publishing, we got to have part of the writing. And man, Chips had a temper, Mark, you know that. And man, he exploded. He got up, I'm not going to say the language he used, but he said, you so-and-so, you leeches. He said, this guy was starving to death. He came up from Houston, Texas, and he wrote a great, great song. And Elvis is going to cut, and y'all want part of the song? He said, I'll tell you what, the session is over. I never seen this. It's a true story. He said, the session is over. He said, you can take these damn tapes and stick them up there, Randy, and get out of the studios. He was really mad because they were trying to get part of the song and market. Worked so hard on it. We had we've been very diligent about carefully presenting it to us, you know. So Harry Jenkins jumped up, the president of RCA. He said, you guys get out of here. He said, uh, he said, I'll talk to Mr. Mullen about this. And so they left. And so Chips turned to me. He said, GK, what do I do about Elvis? And I said, Chips, let me go out. You call Elvis in the control room. When Elvis comes in the control room, I've been around a lot of his sessions. When he comes in the control room, you say to him, Elvis, uh, uh, GK, Elvis, I need to talk to you in private. GK, would you mind excusing us here? And he'll know that's important. You're going you're gonna to talk to him in private. He knows it's important. So I got out in the studio and I'm talking to Bobby Wood, the keyboard player. But out of the corner of my eye, I'm watching because I knew I was like a book. And, and, and Chips is trying to explain it to him, and Elvis just laughing, and he said, I know what he said, I can read his lips. He said, forget about them, I ain't gonna use the language he used. He said, forget about them, so and so. He said, I can read through the window there. He said, Chips, all you gotta worry about is me. Yeah. And Chips said, oh, thank God, Elvis, let's go, let's cut it. That's what happened. I already, he uh, threatened to leave it alone, and, uh, because he's afraid to take it outside and burn the master completely. Yeah, they, uh, these guys were leeches. They were bringing Elvis and B sides, and they were hurting his career, Mark, because he still demanded A sides, and he could have got them, you know, if they hadn't put their two cents in. I want to say one thing about uh, staying away from that session and making sure and not uh, jeopardizing his performance or anything in suspicious moments, because I really wanted that to come off for him, and me too. And uh, I didn't want to jeopardize that in any way. But I will say there's a downside of that. If you go online and you ever go online and see those Memphis sessions, everybody, everybody in the world at the studio had a picture with Elvis for me. <laughs> you can have it any time. But there's also a part three to that story. I don't know if you heard part three. It's the very last night of the session. And I'm over, I'm, I came in from Grayson with Elvis. Was, and so we're in that little bitty office. And Elvis is there to do what they call sweetening up. Mark, sweetening up is where you, where you get to know that maybe you didn't get it in the last session or they add a guitar here. It's called doctoring up the songs a little bit. He's there for this called sweetening up, overdub. So we're in that little out of office. And it's me and Joe Esposito, and that's it. And Elvis is over. Mark, the office was so small. Elvis was over looking at Billboard magazine. I'll never forget it. And so I turned to Joe Esposito, his road manager, and I said, Joe, I made that speech at Graceland. I put my neck way out on a limb. I said, Chips put his neck out, kicked him guys out of his control room. I said, Joe, I have been in radio and television for 25 years. I'll completely resign from radio and television if that's not a number one song on Elvis. I bet my life on it. And he said, you really believe in that much in that song, GK? I said, Joe, I know what I'm talking about. It could be Elvis' biggest selling record. He said, wait a minute. So Joe grabbed me and pulled me over to Elvis. And he said, Elvis. Elvis tells him, yeah, what do you want, Joe? GK, tell Elvis what you just told me. Of course, I talked in a very softer tone, you know. <laughs> and I told him, and this is what he said. He said, yeah, yeah, let's cut that tonight. Let's cut it tonight. We didn't cut it, Mark. It almost didn't get recorded. You talk, so you talk about a song that went through the mill that was worth it, though. It's a great, great song to listen to there. Yes, ma'am. When he wanted me to go, I had nursed him in the hospital a couple of times, and then when... Uh, Dr. Nick said he needed a nurse to go home with him. Well, Elvis said, I'm taking his car. And I said, I ain't. I got a job. <laughs> and he said, well, could this be for at night? And I said, for how long? And he said, Dr. Nick said, well, about two weeks, two and a half weeks. And I said, okay, well, let me check with my husband and my daughter and see what they say. And I'll let you know tomorrow. So I checked and Bob said, how long? And I said, two, two and a half weeks. And he said, okay, that's okay. So I went in the next day and the first thing Elvis said when I walked in the room is, can you come to my house? And I said, yes. And he said, bring your social security card. And I said, 
well, why do you need my social security card? And he said, so you can be paid. And I said, I don't want your money. He said, why the hell don't you want it? Everybody else does. <laughs> and I said, well, I'll do it for you, but I can't. I don't want your money. And so I would go to work every morning from Graceland. Charlie Hodge would cook my breakfast, and I would go to work. And after work, I ran a floor. I had 35 or 36 employees under me. I had 52 patients on my floor. And um, I would go home, cook dinner for my family, visit with my family, and then I would head for Graceland. I would go up to Lisa's room and call Elvis on the house phone. I'd say, honey, I'm here. And he would, uh, in just a few minutes, he'd come plodding down the hall, sounded like a herd of elephants. He, he walked real hard and fast. And he uh, was always barefoot in his pajamas and had his house shoes and his socks in his hands. And our night would begin. We ordered coffee and then I ordered his breakfast. And we visited until time for me to go to bed. And if I was off the next day, we stayed up all night and talked. But if I had to go to bed, I went to bed by midnight. And that was the way it went. And two and a half weeks evolved into six months. And then six months evolved into every time he was in town and wanted me to come out, I would go. And so this went on over the two and a half years. And just three or four days before Elvis died, he called me at two o'clock one morning and asked me if I would come to the house. And I said yes, and um, I went out and sat on the bed, side of his bed, and I said, what do you want, honey? What's, what's going on? He said, I, I just wanted you to, to come and sit with me, and Ginger was there. And I sat on the side of the bed, I put my hand over his arm, and I said, everything okay? And he said, yes, ma'am, I just want you here. And probably we didn't say more than a dozen or so words to each other, but I kept my hand on his arm, and at about 6.30, he said, Ms. Cock, he said, I think I'd go to sleep now. And he said, it's okay for you to go home. And I said, are you sure you're okay? And he said, yes, ma'am. And I got to the door of his room to leave, and he said, Ms. Cock. And I turned around and I said, what is it, honey? And he said, I just want you to know that the doors of this house will always be open to you. And after all this time, they still are. But I do want to tell you <clears throat> that after Elvis had been gone about six or eight weeks, my husband and I were on our way to church. And um, I said to Bob, it seems so strange not to be going to Grace anymore. And he said, you know, while you're still young enough to remember, you should write down what you remember about him, and then when you get too old to remember, you can go back and read what you've written. And I thought, well, that's not a bad idea. So we stopped on the way home. I got a stenographer notebook, went home, and over three or four weeks, I made notes. And then after another three or four weeks, I filled another book, and I took it and put it in my camper chest. And it stayed there for several months. And Vernon was sick and in the hospital. And so of course he called me and I went to see him. And he was very distraught over many of the things that were being said about Elvis and the books that were coming out. And so he said, um, we were talking about it, and I said, well, now, Vernon, I'm going to be honest and tell you, I have written down all I can remember about your son. And I said, I have, a, I have it in a camper chest at home. And I said, this is so that when I get too old to remember, I can take these notes out and read them. And he said, would you let me read them? And I said, well, certainly I'll let you read them. So I took them to him the next day, and he went home from the hospital, and he called me a couple of days later, and he said, Ms. Cock, would you come out to the house? And I said, yeah. You okay? And he said, yes, I'd, I'd just like for you to come out to the house. 
So I went out to the house and we had a cup of coffee and visited for a little while. And he picked up my two notebooks and I thought he was just you know, going to hand them back to me. And he said, I want you to have this published. And I said, Vernon, I can't do that. That's not why I wrote it. I said, I wrote it because I cared about him and I wanted to remember about him. And I said, I can't have this published. And he said, why not? And I said, I never took money from your son when I was nursing him, and I'm not going to start taking money now from, your, from a book. And he said, forget about the damn book, the, the damn money. He said, but you know a side of my son that other people don't, want, don't know. And I want you to know the real Elvis. I want them to know the real Elvis Presley. And Elvis and I had some wonderful times together. <clears throat> I, did, I did go ahead and publish the book. The book has done a lot of good for a lot of people, including building two homes in Frazier for the mentally challenged adults, 12 men and 12 women in each house. And when my sister died, she, she ran the schools because she had a, um, she already took care of profoundly uh, ill children. And she, I always call them God's special children. So she also had adults too. So this money built two homes for 12 people in each house. So then I started having calls from people saying, do you have this on record, and I said, no, well, I'm blind. I'd like to be able to know your story. So after a number of years, I was talking to a producer one night, Alex Ward, <clears throat> and Alex said, how did you meet Elvis? And I told him, and he said, golly, I wish we had recorded that so I could put it on my radio show. And he said, I think you should do an audio book. So, so we did. He came to my house three nights a week. We kept it a deep, dark secret. I didn't even tell George, which is unusual, because I tell George everything, most everything. But I love George, because he's my lovable puppy. And, um, What's Jerry Schilling? Yeah. Jerry Schilling is my pick of the litter, and Tom Brown is my, Tom Brown is my terrific Tommy Terrier. So he's three to me. So I got a name for my three guys. <laughs> but anyway, I, I did the CD, and I didn't let Priscilla know either. <clears throat> so the night before it came out, I called her. And I said, Priscilla, I have to tell you something I've done. And she said, what have you done now? <laughs> and I said, I've done an audio book. I've got to have it. And I said, okay. I'm going to send you the first one. So it cost, the next day I got the audio book, I took it to the post office, it cost me $31 to overnight it. And I didn't hear from her for a while, and I thought, golly Moses, you know, we haven't done something wrong. So she called me and she said, Miriam, I promise you this is exactly what she said to me. She said, I have listened to your audio book. I love it because it is filled with honesty, sincerity, and love. And she said, it's a part of my permanent library. And that, um, that's the only reason it was ever done, was because people said, I can't see, I can't read. Please do an audio book. And Priscilla asked me first, she said, did you read the book? And I said, no, it's strictly off the cuff. And everything in that audio book is strictly off the cuff. And it was interesting because I could really say things in the book that the University of Memphis wouldn't let me print <laughs> because of some of the things that were, the, the instances that happened. And Elvis and I had a great time together. And you know, I was more of a nurse companion to Elvis and a confidant than I was anything else. And Elvis would tell me something, and he would say, Ms. Cox, this is confidential. Well, he may have told 12 or 15 other people the same thing and told them the same thing, but to me, it's still confidential. 
And I have never, ever revealed anything that Elvis said to me that was confidential. And, and I'll take it to my grave. And Jerry Schilling said one time, he said, you've never said anything. I said, I've never even went home and told Bob or Katie anything that Elvis ever told me. And all they knew was that he was a wonderful friend, a wonderful person, that I cared about him, and that we sort of clicked. The chemistry was there. Scott, how about a nice round of applause? Everybody always asks me how to sell this kiss. And my remark is, well, they say practice makes perfect. He'd had plenty of practice before he ever got to me. <laughs> he has a great story. I'm the only guy on the stage that knew her back in those days. Uh, and I was with Elvis working with him at that time, and she, we, he lived on Audubon Drive. But Barbara, it's a cute story. Tell the story how you first met Elvis and how y'all started dating. Well, uh, I knew Dixie Locke, who was dating Elvis. And this is the story I've always told everybody, and I thought it was true. Uh, that Dixie and I worked together at Goldsmith's department store, and he would take Dixie home, and I lived on the way, and he would take me home. But um, he, he was he was funny. He had a wonderful sense of humor. I remember once he was listening to uh, oh, what was her name? Somebody Brown sing Quigley D. Brown. 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 And he jumped out of the car right in the middle of Main Street with traffic going everywhere and started singing Quigley D. And he said, um, at least it's early days. He said, you know who's going to sell a million copies of that song? <laughs> but uh, that's that's the kind of thing he did, and it was um. It was always fun to be around him. Well, he and Dixie broke up, and a few months later, I just happened to run into him. And um, I was modeling for Carol Longstein for television, and um, he came to the window and saw me in there. I was up against the glass and uh, was looking, and um, when, when I walked out, the first thing he said was, how's Dixie? And I thought that was so sweet. You know, he still cared. But I hadn't seen her since he had, so, so I, I really didn't know. But now I found out that I went to a birthday party when I was in the 10th grade, and he was there. Some of our mutual friends told me that, so I've had to change my story. That wasn't the first time I met him. So, but I would like to add just one little story that is my favorite Elvis story. And um, so we've been seeing each other just a few months. And uh, although he was doing very well, he really didn't have much money, but he had much compared to what he had had. And um, I told him I was going to start at Memphis State, which is now University of Memphis. And uh, I lived a good distance from Memphis State, and I lived a good distance from the nearest bus stop. And he said, well, how are you going to get there? And I said, oh, I'm going to ride the bus. And he looked at me like I'd lost my mind. He said, you can't ride the bus. It's blocks to the bus stop. What are you going to do if it rains, if it snows, if it's cold? I said, I don't care. You can't talk me out of it. I've made my mind. I'm going. And if I have to ride the bus, I just ride the bus. So a few days later, we were out riding in the motorcycle. And he pulled into a car lot. And a man came out and said, can I help you? And Elvis said, yes, I want that car for this girl. And then he said to me, now you don't have to ride the bus. And uh, that, that, was, that was the real person that I knew, uh, regardless of, you know, the fame and the fortune and him getting to be the boss later on and the king. Uh, that was the boy I knew. And he, he but Barbara, excuse me to interrupt and interject here. Tell him uh, how you, on the Ed Sullivan show, you gave up was a gift and he wore it off. That's a great story. Well, you know, Christmas was coming up in 56. By that time, he was really rolling. And if he didn't have it, he could go out and buy it. And I didn't know what in the world to give him for Christmas. And, um, of course, I didn't have a lot of money. And uh, half my life is tied up with Goldsmiths, I think. And half of that in the bargain basement. And so I was down there walking around, and I saw some gold on the material. And it just hit me. That's, that's what I'll do. So I bought a pattern for a man's vest, and um, the three little letters, E-A-P, and the thread, and uh, I bought 
probably a yard and a half of gold lame and a yard and a half of uh, black satin to go on the inside. And I took it to a girlfriend's mother who could just sew like a dream. And for nothing, she made me this beautiful vest. Whole thing cost less than ten dollars. And I gave it to him and he loved it. And he wore it on the Ed Sullivan show without telling me. I just, you know, I was watching the show with his parents and uh, my goodness, when he came over with that vest, I almost had to prevent it. I just couldn't believe it. It was, it was a real compliment, and it was a beautiful way of saying, yes, I do love it. Uh, Barbara Hannon is, is a wonderful young lady. She did not try to capitalize whatsoever when Elvis became famous. She married her husband, who's here today, and he was a Secret Service. Is that Secret Service? Or? No, he was Central Intelligence. Such a CIA, CIA, and so she was hard to find for me because I wanted to interview her, man. I called her mother, she said, well, George, she's living in Washington, now she's in Florida. She was going all over the world, but my point is that she never gave a story or anything to that effect. And I was really liked her a lot. And another person in Elvis' life loved you, and that was Gladys Presley. Talk, you were one of the few ladies that Elvis dated his mama really liked. Talk about Mrs. Presley. Well, it, it I, I know she liked me, but you know, she wanted to like anybody that, that he liked. And she, not everybody. Well, I know she was crazy about you guys, and uh, we were just good friends. I, I think she was a lot like some of the ladies in my family, because I just felt wrong to her from the very beginning, and uh, she would have Mr. Presley drive her over to my house and uh, pick me up, go for the proverbial Sunday afternoon drive that we used to go on. And, you know, maybe in a big family there was one car. And um, I don't know, we, we were just good friends. We got along very well. And uh, the way she worried about him, my grandmother worried about my father like that. And the way he loved her and showed her attention, my father did that to his mother. I think he saw his mother every day of his life. He either stopped by or called or something, and that's what Elvis did. So I didn't find it the least bit unusual that uh, they were so tied to each other. And uh, I can remember going downtown to the Los Palace and the Malco and excusing myself to go to the restroom when really what I did was go out and call her and say, this is where we are and everything's fine. And, uh, she was at that time. Yeah. In the movie theater, yeah. Yeah, and, and she appreciated that kind of thing. And, uh... I'll tell you, Barb, and I think you'll agree with me. I think I said in my book, I'm not sure. I, I think and I, some of Elvis' really, really, really close friends agree with me. Uh, Jerry Schilling, Joe Esposito, <coughs> Charlie Rogers, that if Mrs. Presley, Mrs. Gladys Love Presley, had lived longer, there was a very, very good chance that Elvis Presley would be alive today. However, she was, um, you know, she was so upset about the people being, so many people being around him, and uh, she just worried about him so much. I, I really don't think there was much chance of her living out a long life. She, she literally worried herself to death, I guess. I don't know. She, she was a wonderful lady. The reason she liked me a lot, I think, because I was president of the senior class, and she came to the graduation because Elvis is the only person in his family that graduated from high school, and she treated me like a stepson or something. You know, she would, her arms were always open to me. I'd call her and tell Miss Preston this. But she, there's a lot of cute things about her. But I'll never forget one, I will move on. Plus, the first time I went on the road with Elvis, she pulled me aside, and she said, George, now, when you go with Elvis, she said, he, he keeps money in his pockets. He carries money in his pants pockets. And when you guys send it down to the cleaners, he don't, he don't take the money out of the pockets. And he said, he said, she said, would you please check his coats before he the pants before you send them down to the laundry at the hotel where you guys are staying? Make sure Elvis doesn't leave a lot of money in there. I said, okay, Miss Preston, I sure will. And the other one was, <clears throat> she said, George. She said, now you're going to probably be sleeping with Elvis on the road somewhere. And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, he, he walks and talks in his sleep. And I've never seen anybody walk in their sleep. So I'm in bed, we're at the bed, we at the, uh, uh, no, I don't know, off of Park Avenue. What was it, what was that house? The Audubon Drive. 
Drive House. 3164, something like that. Ottoman Drive. No, that's Grayson. Anyway, we went to Ottoman Drive House. And uh, getting ready to go on the road. And she said, uh, George, now he talks in his sleep. And I said, Miss Preston, what do I do? She said, when he gets up and starts walking, she said, very softly, whatever you do, don't holler at him. They say, Elvis, would you please come on back to bed? Come on, Elvis, we got, we got to get up early tomorrow. And lo and behold, I was spending the night at Ottoman Drive, the first night before we went on the road. Because I lived way over in North Memphis, and he didn't want to take me home. So you stay here, I'll have to come pick you up. I said, okay, Elvis. So anyway, he gets up and walks in his sleep. It happened that very night. And I'm looking at him, I've never seen anybody do that. And I said, Elvis, Elvis, I said, uh, come on now, get back in bed, because we got to get up, we're going to Hollywood tomorrow. we got a long trip on that train, and, and we got a lot of stuff ahead of us that tour all across America. Why is it? Elvis, please, come on, get back. And I talked very softly, and he came back, got back in bed, went to sleep. I never told him about that, but he kind of scared me a little bit. But Gene Smith, another one happened like that in Los Angeles, and Gene and I had a, he got up on a windowsill. <laughs> And we're on the seventh floor at the Beverly Woods where we stayed, and Gene uh, stayed in the next room, and I just happened to be there, and Gene said, A GK, we've got to go talk to Cuz. He called Elvis Cuz. I said, What's wrong? He said, He's going to jump out this window. I said, What are you talking about, Gene? And Elvis was up on the window ledge, and he was walking in his sleep. And so, Gene, I, I just stood back and watched Gene. He said, Come on, Cuz, now, you got to get off that window. You can hurt yourself. We got a big movie studio at Mark, 9 o'clock. Come on, cuz. And Elvis got back down and went back to bed. But that happened. But you know what, Barbara? He never walked or talked in his sleep once he went to the Army. For some reason, when he came out of the Army, he never did it again. I asked Priscilla, some of the other ladies who spent some time with Elvis, and said, no, they never experienced what I just told you about. But Barbara, any parting words from you, honey? Funny words. Party, P A R. Oh, party. <laughs> Oh yeah, talk about your book. This, this is a book that Ryan Allward and Nella, his wife, yeah. have brought from Canada. And uh, evidently this man has, has written several, several Elvis books. And uh, they brought this one down to ask George to... Um, plug it. To, well, to sure. plug it and to give it away. Oh, want to give it away? Yes, as a book Okay, we got some stuff to give away. Uh, uh, part of, first of all... England, Italy. Italy. Where's the furthest in Australia? Would be further than England. I can't hear everybody talking the same. What you say? Oh, the Netherlands. Sandy, what do you think? What's the furthest, England or the Netherlands? Get somebody to Google it. Huh? Okay, give them the T-shirt, Will. Give them the T-shirt. Okay, now, <clears throat> Mr. Barbie, want to give this away? Okay. All right, the first person that can tell me what was the name of Elvis's music teacher in the eighth grade when I first met him. Miss Mormon. Mormon. That's right. Give it to her, bro. Miss Mormon, when we, in his eighth grade music class, you read my book, Elvis gets up and sang, sings, and I was amazed. I couldn't see anybody do that. Okay, now, well, we're going to give away the, oh, before we give away the jacket, Cynthia, anything you want to say? I want to say thank you so much for having me, George, here. And uh, thank you for loving Elvis like you do. It keeps him in the lives of memory. We all knew him, but in a different way. And God bless you, and, and God bless Elvis. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Little Kim here has been quiet all day. And her husband was Richard. And I'll tell a little cute story quickly. We're in Hollywood, California. Making the movie Jailhouse Rock. We're up in Elvis' dressing room. Clark Gable's the former dressing room, by the way. So, uh, Alan Fortis' middle name was Alan E. Fortis. He was one of the Elvis' traveling companions early on. They didn't call us Memphis Mafia then. So, he said, well, Elvis, he said, my middle name is Elvis. And he said, you're alive. So, Richard said, he pulled out his driver's license, and he said, Alan E. Fortis. And Elvis looked, looked at me, and Richard said, well, Elvis, my middle name is Elvis. And he said, you're crazy. <laughs> Richard pulled out his driver's license and had Richard E. Davis. So <clears throat> I said, Elvis, these guys are full of crap. He said, I know it, but how can we prove it? 
I said, can I make a long distance phone call? He said, yeah. So I knew, I called the Memphis Health Department and acted like I was in Hollywood and we're going to hire them. I said, can you tell me if uh, you, you have a Alan E. Ford is born in Memphis, Tennessee, such and such a guy came out. I said, yeah, what was his middle name? He said, his middle name was Edward, Al Alan Edward Fortis. <coughs> and I said, if you got one named Richard E. Davis, came back and said, yeah, his name was Elvin, E-L-V-I-N. And Elvin said, well, at least it was close, Richard said, at least it was close, Elvin. <laughs> Yeah, he missed it by one letter. Um, I just like to welcome everybody to my hometown and um, tell you, my fr is anybody's first Elvis week this this time? Well, welcome. Uh, my first Elvis week. I lived in Memphis my whole life. I was kind of a closet Elvis fan. I was 19. So none of my friends were Elvis fans, so I went down to Graceland. Um, met Richard, met George, met all these people on stage. Um, Skipper introduced me to a lot of the guys. And then he asked me to go to Marion's dinner. And um, went to Marion's dinner, sitting in the back. She comes back to the back and sits, says, I'm going to bring you up to the front. And I said, OK. She sits me down with the Jordanaires, Sam Phillips, Richard, George. And uh, I'm just in awe, like I am sitting up here today. Um, and uh, you know, a few, few years later, Richard and I get married. We have triplets. Um, it just shows you that this week can change your lives. And I hope you all have a great time here in Memphis. It's not too hot for me. Um, this one quick story that I always like to show the fun side of Elvis that Richard used to always tell is they were in the house that had the two staircases that met at the top and Elvis wouldn't come out to play. And Richard and Billy started lighting pieces of paper and putting it under the door to smoke Elvis out. Um, he did eventually come out and he ran after Billy. Down one, and Billy went down one side, Richard went down the other side. Um, Billy then went back upstairs and barricaded himself into Elvis's room. Richard went into the area that had all the electrical um, that ran the house and also where they kept Scatter in his cage. And it was dark in there, but um, Elvis saw Richard run in there and he's hiding. And Elvis is swinging his belt, figuring, you know, if he's in here and I hit him, of course, with my belt, it'd probably just leave a, a, a welt. With Elvis's belt, it'd probably kill you. Um, <laughs> But he eventually ran up and I saw Billy shimmying out the, uh, the window. I think he had tied some sheets together. And uh, Richard uh, wound up hiding near the swimming pool in the backyard under a, a big box that had uh, they brought like a refrigerator or a washer dryer. And then Elvis finally found him and raised up the box and went back with his belt and then started laughing. But that was just the fun, some of the fun things. They met, uh, Richard didn't have a really good childhood and a lot of the guys grew up without a lot of money. And um, I just thank Elvis for um, letting them experience things that they would have not been able to experience had it not been for him. And I also thank him for um, helping me have all these wonderful friends. And uh, the only thing I would change is that um, Richard would be up here instead of me. Kim, lovely. Dancing Kim. She used to come down here, Richard, we were doing that show, and she'd get out there and dance. We, we love to watch her dance. Uh, we're not finished yet. We're here until 7, but uh, Bartle, you haven't installed anything yet. Give me that call. I tell you what, that call, Kim talking. Richard and I were friends. And I was talking to Richard one day, and I said, uh, Richard, you know, I said, I don't think Kim likes me. He looked at me and said, no, she hates you. <laughs> what it was, Richard had a friend and they would go out partying. And I don't know if he was telling her it was me or what that he was partying with, but she didn't like me because I was taking Richard out and getting him drunk. And it wasn't me. Finally, she got the story right and uh, we've been friends ever since. Now, everybody's got a book up here. I got a book too. And uh, after, after I read George Klein's book, I wrote mine. Because if it wasn't for his book, I'd have never wrote my book. And there's no comparison. And every, everything in it is just what I remember to the best of my knowledge. Just like everybody up here, they write from the heart. And so if you buy a book from anybody up here, 
greatest thing you can do to help them. George's book, if it wasn't for his, I'd have never rolled a nine. The one thing about Elvis, he loved everybody. how you gave him the I worked at Rainbow Skate Rink. I was 17 years old. The guy that run the skate rink was was uh, sick one night. He asked me if I worked a private party. He said, all you gotta do is give out the skates, put them up when you get through with, them, lock up and go home. He said, they pay you $50. 1957, $50 was a whole lot of money. But he forgot to tell me whose party it was. So after we locked up the rink and all, Next door to the skating rink was a terrace room, which was a fine nightclub eating establishment. Two guys come in, they open the front door, they let in 150, 200 people. I've been skating there at the rink for years, and I didn't know one person that came in. I gave out all the skates and all, put on my skates, I got out there skating with them. All about 20, 30 minutes later, Elvis come walking in. He'd been next door eating. Now I know whose party it is, so I get off the floor. He had his skates locked up, so I got his skates and gave it to him. We all got out there skating. After about 10 or 15 minutes, somebody gets to blow a whistle. I get to look around. All the females are getting off the floor. The men, half are going to one end of the ring, the other half are another end of the ring. I'm down on this end, Elvis is down there. I tell the guy next to me, I say, hey, I'd like to get a hold of Elvis. He said, wait just a minute. Hey, Elvis, this guy wants you. Elvis said, okay. I always heard about their little games they played and all. So they blow the whistle, we have a free for all in the middle. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick it to you. Well, about five minutes later when I woke up, they had me in a chair and a rag on my head and Elvis sitting there fanning me, apologizing. I said, oh man, I said, this is your party, so let's go play some more. Everybody gets back out there, now I am pissed. We all get back out there, line up, blow the whistle again. About five minutes later, when I woke up the second time, he got me back in the chair, got a rag on my head, he's fanning me again, apologizing. Man, I said, this is your part, let's go play some more. Everybody lines up again. They blow the whistle. Everybody stands on the rail with Elvis and I, just the two of them come down the floor. Payback's a bitch. <laughs> we clattered in the middle and I got up and looked down here they were laid out cold. They got Red West and all of them coming out there. I run over to the table, chair, go underneath and hide the car. About five minutes later when Elvis woke up, Red West come over there and he said, hey Elvis, he's over here. <laughs> oh darn. I know I got it coming now. Elvis comes over there, he looks under the table and does this. I start calling out front of the table. And like George said earlier, my dad raced automobiles. A friend of his owned the Bart Hall Distributorship in Memphis. Bart Hall is a motor oil engine. They still make it to this day. So I come out and I got this t-shirt on and Bart Hall across. Standing up, Elvis is in front of me and Red Wilson to my right. Elvis, he looks at me and he looks down at my t-shirt. Looks back up, looks like at my t-shirt again and said, Bart off. Said, Red, said, I like it. Give him the phone number up to the house, he can come up anytime he wants. Elvis turned around and skated away. Red Wiz pulled out a pen and paper, wrote down the phone number Grayson, E8744427, and handed it to me and turned around and skated away. Now here I've just been knocked out twice by Elvis. I just knocked Elvis out. You know, an invitation come up to Grayson any time I want. That just show you what type of person he was. And I hope everybody enjoyed being here in Memphis. Hope to see y'all again some other time. Will supported me and Emanuela's wife is here. Where, where's Emanuela? She here part of? Oh, back in, back in the area? I don't see Emanuela. Oh, there she is. Oh, there she is. Yeah, okay. Uh, Bardall is really seriously has helped me a whole lot of producing my show. He's always been very supportive of anything we do concerning Elvis. Give him a nice round of applause. Uh, Dr. McCoy, I mean, Dr. Victoria Flynn.
got clean. I'm just going to give you a, a microphone. But the reason I'm up here is we've heard stories about who Elvis was and who who's keeping this alive. And this man right here, George Klein, is keeping this alive for us. And I think he needs a real round of applause. Dr. George Clint, really a good guy, and every time we call upon him, he's always able to take care of it concerning uh, WHBQ Radio, being the first historic station in the world to play the Elvis record. Uh, Gino, come on, man, give us a good story before we wrap. Okay, uh, I'm going to go back. Uh, we were at Graceland, and Elvis, uh, he was giving everybody motorcycles, and I didn't want a motorcycle because I... I just didn't like riding motorcycles. Anyway, so he asked me, he said, well, I'll tell you what, you can just ride on the back of mine and just see how you like it. So uh, we all take off, and back in the day, do you remember that Tropicana orange juice had that big old, so anyway, I had to put water in it and hold it in this hand, and this other hand was holding on to the seat of, of his cycle. Now, Elvis had a helmet on, he had his shade down, and he had a cigar in his mouth, okay? <laughs> But he wasn't smoking, he was chewing. So anyway, we take off, we're going about 75 miles an hour, and he just keeps looking back at me. I'm going like, what is he saying? You know, I go, and he said something to me. I said, yeah. And I just, yeah, yeah. And I said it like, first time he kept going faster and faster. Second time he kept going faster. I didn't think anything of it, but on the third time he just took off. I'm going like, man, what's he doing? So anyway, we keep on riding, ride through the gates, come through the gates, go to the uh, front door. Stop right there, he gets off, and he says, damn, he says, I got to hand it to you. I ain't ever heard anybody say, you want to go faster, faster, faster? Uh -huh. I looked at him and I said, I never heard a word you said. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I was scared to death if he turned around, you know, he might, you know. But I will say this, after working for him, I was lucky enough to work for him when I did. You learn to be a better giver in life when you work for Elvis because Elvis could give you something. He gave me two cars, but... He liked those cars better than I did, and I was 19 years old. You know, I was going nuts. But that's that's the way Elvis was. He was just he was an unreal giver, and you, and you know that. And um, he was a prankster. He, you know, he played jokes on everybody. He thought it was funny. And if you pulled one on him, you better be ready because you didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> so and, um, I remember uh, we were uh, I guess we were coming through. Uh, we were on tour going over Niagara Falls. And um, I was the guy that got up and I got on there by the co-pilots and everything. You, you could sit in at least some real that little seat. And I got on the microphone and I said, let me have that microphone just to see. And so I got on there and I said, I acted like I was one of the pilots, told everybody to get on the right-hand side and go look, and told me it was all lit up tonight. Well, I didn't know he was going to do it. I thought, you know, I'd get all the guys to do it. So every one of the guys were on the right-hand side just looking to see how pretty it was. So Elvis is in the back bedroom back there, and he gets up and looks. It's just pitch black. I mean, it's as black as it can be. He couldn't see nothing. So I, I hear this call back up to the cockpit. Elvis had a phone way up there, and he could call back up. And he calls back up, and he goes, who was that? What, what is going on? And he said, here. They hand me the phone microphone. I mean, my, I get on the phone. He says, get your butt back here, like, right now. <laughs> so I'm walking back, and all the guys are looking at me walking back. You know, I was only like... That was one of the second tours I took, so you know they were all looking at me like, man, he's in the world, you know what? So anyway, I walked back there, and he says, listen. And he had, he had he, I think I embarrassed him because he had somebody with him, you know, and he's looking like, so anyway, so he goes, I'm not going to tell you. But anyway, anyway uh, so anyway, he says, uh, he looks up and he says, let me tell you something. When you do this, just let me know. I don't want to look like a dummy, okay? I don't mind the rest of the guys, but when I do it and there's nothing there, it don't look right. So just warn me, will you? And that was our big thing, you know. So. But um, out of all the years, three and a half, I, worked, I actually knew him about, in 72, I started teaching him racquetball. And he would always come up, we would play at the Memphis Athletic Club where we first started. And the uh, very first time we, I met him playing racquetball, uh, I think George, my dad, and about two other guys were downstairs in the dressing room. You know, they were taking sauna and the steam. I'm going like, we're playing racquetball. What's taking so long? You know, I couldn't. Understand. I didn't know these why these guys are so. They're real slow. You know, they're going to do it on their time. So I'm sitting up there, and Elvis says, "I tell you what, you go on a racquetball court, 
And uh, Linda Thompson was there at the time, and he says, go, sh you go in there and hit some balls with her. I said, okay. So I'm in there and hitting, I bet we must have hit for 35 minutes, and I'm going, <laughs> where is he coming? Anyway, about that time, Elvis, most people, when they go to a racquetball door, they knock on the door so they don't hit anything. Elvis gives it like a little karate kick and hits it, and he goes, bam, and he goes like that, and I'm going, and I am going, what? Well, he said, what are you doing up here with my girlfriend? I mean, you have been up here 30 minutes, just you and her. What is going on? I'm going like, wait a minute. I need, but he's playing pranks. This is his prankster thing, you know. So after he did all that, we just learned to play jokes. We played jokes with each other, which was a lot of fun, you know. So any other questions? I'll tell you what. His daddy, Dr. George Nicopolis, was my doctor, and uh, I introduced him, I got him and Elvis together, it's a long story. But anyway, I'd like to say this, and his doctor, there's sort of in dire, his father, Dr. Nick, is in dire straits today. Uh, won't get into all of that, but he doesn't have the money that he had when he was a doctor. He's been stripped of his medical practice license and all of that. It's really a sad situation. We're trying to help Dr. Nick, but I will say this, and I guess uh, these people on stage will agree with me that Dr. Nicopolis, Dino, was the good doctor. The bad doctor, I'm not going to name him, was in Las Vegas, Nevada. He was known as the doctor to the stars, if you get anything you want. The bad dentist was a guy dentist in Los Angeles. He was a bad, had Dr. Dr. Nick been there, instead of Dr. whatever he was in Vegas, won't give you his name, he's passed away by now. But Dr. George Nicopolis, ladies and gentlemen, believe you me, was the good doctor. We're going to give this coat away, and uh, we're going to wrap it about five minutes. Now, if anybody got anything else to say, just let me know. Still, if you, it's, a, it's a 42 regular, and this was an exact duplicate of the jacket that Elvis got married in. So, what we want to know is, uh, who uh, came the most times to this event? This is our 23rd year. So just how, about how many times you've been here? <laughs> no, I can't take it. Uh, who, Mary, Mary Ruth, how many? What'd you say, Mary Ruth? How many times have you been to this event, Mary Ruth? You've been here one What'd you say? 24? Any, can anybody top that? What, honey? What'd you say? Me? What, I, I, my hearing is bad today. Here's just, what'd you say? I don't count. I don't. I've got one of these. I bought one of these from Lansky Brothers. It's a collector's item. He has duplicated some of the merchandise Elvis Warren movies and famous pictures, and he does marvelous work down there. He's a very charitable guy. Uh, Mary Ruth, you came 24 years. Is that right? Can anybody top that? All right, let's give it to Mary Ruth Barnum. What did you guys do, you and Elvis, at Audubon Drive? What'd you say? What'd you say? You're talking to a bunch of old people up here. What'd you say? When you were on Audubon Drive with Elvis, what did you guys do in the house? Oh, what? When you came to Audubon Drive, what happened at Audubon Drive? Well, I'll tell you what happened, and she can pick it up. One night, we were there, just me and Elvis and Barbara, and Elvis is at the piano. We started playing Name That Tune. And I'm really bad, even over this jockey, I can't recognize two, uh, melodies. And Barbara was hitting every one. Remember, tell that story, Barbara. Yeah, that, that was great fun. Um, what, what did he do about that organ? He just went out one day and, and uh, told his mama, clear this space out, the organ's coming, this little thing. I forget exactly, but it was a big surprise when he bought that organ. And uh, he'd never played an organ before, but it didn't take him long. Like this character here, you know, these musical people that I had just envy so much. But it wasn't long before he was playing the organ and uh, play a few notes and try to get you to, to recognize it. And uh, I'm not musical at all, but I had a good memory. And uh, I knew, knew most of the songs. But we do just, uh, in the beginning, just ordinary things. We played pool, and uh, I had never played pool before. And we listened to records, you know, and if it was one he liked, we listened to it over and over and over. 
you know, picking out bits and pieces of it and analyzing it, and just like I knew what I was doing, which I didn't. But uh, anyway, we had fun, just stuff like that, having dinner. It, it really it wasn't any wild parties at Oakland Drive, I'll tell you why. Because uh, they didn't have a large entourage at that time, and also the house was so small. You ever been to Oakland Drive? Okay, you know the rooms are real close together. There's a, a his grandma stayed in one room, Mr. Vince Presley stayed in the other room, Elvis in the other room. That was it. The night that I was here, I slept with Elvis in that room. But we didn't have any wild parties out there, did we? They, they happened in Grayson, though. <laughs> Sandy, come on up here. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Sandy Robinson, she provides this venue for us. And every time, George brings a great crowd to tell us a lot of stories. This is a super night. If y'all have not read their books, please do so. You will learn so much from them. As you know, everything that we raise here tonight goes to charities. So I have two checks up here, and I'm going to present them to two people. The first is for Miss Cox Charity. You know, she does the Elvis Presley Memorial Dinner every year, and she has a group of charities that she donates to. So we have a check for her. I've got to tell you something about Sandy. Well, first of all, she was married to Johnny, and I loved Johnny. He was like my child. And um, he died two years after my daughter. But Johnny always raved about how smart Sandy was. And he, that's, you know, she's the smartest woman I ever knew in my life. But one night after Johnny had died, Sandy came to my house for dinner with her, one of the managers, and um, I, I don't remember what, what I cooked, but anyway, spaghetti. And that was the last meal that Johnny had had at my house when he came to eat, and, uh, and he told me what kind of wine he wanted me to get, because I thought I'd ask him, because I don't know anything about wine or alcohol or stuff like that, so I had to ask him, and he told me. But anyway, there was still some in the refrigerator, and how long had Johnny been gone? Several months? Well, at, at least, and, and, and not knowing about alcohol, I still had it in the refrigerator. So I fixed a glass for Sandy, and for Eddie, I took, <laughs> took them this glass of wine, and I noticed that they only took a little tiny sip. So later on, months later, I said to Eddie, Eddie, what was wrong with that wine? And he said, well, Miss Cock, I hate to tell you, but it had turned to vinegar. <laughs> but I want you to know that I still have that empty bottle with Johnny's name on it, and it's sitting in my kitchen on the cabinet, and it has a little silver angel on the top of it. And Johnny Robinson is hard. Sandy will play. It's the biggest in this club. I'll give you a quick story. Richard Davis was here one night. We get a long distance phone call. I'm doing a disc jockey show over here. I said, he comes back. Who was it, Richard? He says, long distance in California. My mother just passed away. And Johnny was standing there, Johnny Robertson. And Richard said, man, I don't know how I'm going to get out to California for the funeral. Johnny Robertson said, don't worry about it. I bought him a round trip ticket to California to attend Richard's mother's funeral. Johnny, these people are wonderful people. They run this establishment. All right, I have one more check to present, and that is to Gray Morrison with Make-A-Wish. And if Gray will come up here. I'm going to let her tell you. I don't know if y'all are familiar with Make-A-Wish, so I'm going to let her tell you a little bit about what they do. Um, thank you so much, Sandy, for this generous donation. I, on behalf of Make-A-Wish Mid-South, uh, greatly appreciate y'all's support again this year. For those of you that don't know, Make-A-Wish grants the wishes of children with life-threatening medical conditions between the ages of two and a half and 18. And we can grant wishes for kids to go to Disney World, to go, we'll fly them to meet their favorite celebrity. And this summer, we've actually sent a child to Japan on her wish. So wishes can be anything. And so um... we're going to continue this tradition as long as we possibly can and as long as George will show up every year. She so, does a great job, really. We hope to see you again next year. Enjoy all this week in Memphis, Tennessee. Wait, hold on. Before you go, ladies and gentlemen, she not only owns this place, she
she owns the, the hamburger joint Dyer's next door. Uh, she owns a place by the Peabody. She is a wonderful business lady and has done a marvelous job taking the ball and ran with it when Johnny passed away. Appreciate you all coming. But thanks a lot. Uh, we'll see you down the road at some of the events. Rachel has some marvelous events set up for you this year. Be sure to check me out on Sirius XM Satellite Radio. I'm on every Friday from 2 to 6. Uh, they play back on Monday night. And also, I do the Elvis Hour on Sunday morning and Sunday night on Sirius XM Satellite Radio. So check us out. All right.